Mr. Speaker, um, hopefully you'll give me the opportunity to just um, highlight some individuals from my constituency that have recently passed. You all have probably heard of the very sad situation in front of the Miku police station where an individual was attacked by somebody from behind. Um, a gentleman who was attacked is called Joseph Joseph from Duga. Um, must be very heartbreaking for the family what transpired. I certainly wanted to express my public sympathy and hopefully the House would join me in this sadness of his death. Um, was very obviously unexpected a healthy gentleman and was just attacked and there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to why he was attacked. I also want to um, highlight a very special person to me, one of the persons who I first met when I went to <coughs> Miku South. Um, she was 102, um, Veronica, Veronica Severin, who um, was an amazing, amazing woman. And um, I'm going to miss her very dearly. I know her funeral is on, on Friday. And yes, Mr. Thomas James, who was an individual who contributed significantly to the government of St. Lucia, considered him a very dear friend. And uh, I very much appreciated his commitment to the development of the overall constituency. Um, I, too, once again, um, lend my voice of support and sympathy towards the people of Morocco. Um, very, very sad what has transpired. We saw the same thing happening in Turkey with the earthquake. Um, at the last count, I believe that we're certainly surpassing 2,500 people who have, who have perished so far. And there are many more that are probably going to perish um, in that. And again, Morocco has been a very good friend, as the Prime Minister has indicated to us, both in terms of the fertilizer support that they've given to um, our farmers for many years, the, the uh, scholarships, and I was very happy to hear that none of the uh, students that were in Morocco were affected by this, but obviously they probably are a bit traumatized. So again, uh, my sympathies go out to the people of Morocco, and certainly I um, very much appreciate the support the government has given, hopefully to the students, um, our students that are over there. And I, and I really wish um, Morocco well in its, in its recovery. Mr. Speaker, um, this bill, very interesting bill, in that the motion, thank you, the Saudi fund is making available to the government of St. Lucia $75 million. It should be also known that the same sum of monies have been made available to several, if not all, of the CARICOM countries as well. And I very much appreciate the Saudis' um, interest in the Caribbean um, and their, their expansion on the international scene, and I think this is very worthwhile coming. I'm also very grateful, I'm sure the member from Beaufort South would also be grateful that unlike some of the other development agencies that have insisted that this money go through the CDB process, that it, they seem to be allowing the government to negotiate with them on a bilateral basis. And I think that that's very, very, very good. Um, there's an old saying, Mr. Steve, I wish it was not really an old saying, it was something that became very, very famous in the uh, murder case with O.J. Simpson. I think we remember when Cochran stood up and he said, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. And I would say to you that that's where we are in many ways, Mr. Speaker. You know, today is a good day, but it's a day that's worth of some reflection. I've sat back and I've listened to two contributions in the House who continue to seem to perpetuate um, a story that certainly the facts don't rise to those, to those statements. And that's why, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. If the evidence is not there to support and substantiate the allegations, you cannot make them. So, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take the opportunity, I'd like to take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to Member for Castries Central, please allow the member to make his contribution. 
that this situation clearly started after the fire. And the initial decision that was made by the then Stevenson King administration was to repair the damaged theater that was burnt and also to take the time to fix up some of the existing buildings, but certainly not to really expand the overall services that were being provided. Um, and to move the persons back from the stadium as quickly as possible. And then there was talk to build a new hospital for St. Jude's. And several locations were identified. Work commenced about a year before the elections. And members on the opposite side have continued to allege then that when they came into office that works had only been 30% completed. Although there were claims by then Stevenson King and our administration that works had been almost 80% completed and could have been finished. Okay, so you can go back in history and look. So, Mr. Speaker, the then Prime Minister, and I will, and I will then go through it when he came in, um, Dr. Anthony, was faced with the dilemma as to do I continue to work on this particular project or to proceed on building a new hospital. And I believe that they would have done the analysis, hopefully, to look at all the different locations and the decision was made to continue and expand the existing St. Jude's. That's the decision that was made. And when you look at the, and I'll get to it, the exit report of Shanta King, one will discover the reason why many people do not go in an attempt to refurbish old buildings. And I, and I want us to remember, when we speak about old, the St. Jude's building is 80 years old, Mr. Speaker. 1942 is when that building was first opened. 80 years old, 81. So the Prime Minister decided, and we have the, the Shanta King report, Mr. Speaker, and if we go to page four of the Shanta King report, we see what was in the mindset at that time. And it said the goal of the project initiated was to rebuild St. Jude Hospital to reinstate the core and ancillary health services previously offered to the public in keeping with the government's health sector objectives and expanded where necessary. The design was expected to produce an effective and efficient healthcare facility according to the modern day requirements. So it was to take the burnt down building and to try to modernize it as much as possible, but the intention was not to expand it at all. The initial policy decision in April of 2010, Prime Minister Honorable Stevenson King, and that's why it's so great that we have these things documented. We don't really have to go back and debate and, and question what's right and what's wrong. It's documented, and now that it's historical. The government of St. Lucia initially took a decision to develop a two-pronged approach to the implementation of the St. Lucia, the, the St. Jude Hospital reconstruction project. A, short-term solution temporary accommodation for the St. Jude Hospital. This would entail the reconstruction of the surgical wing on the old site, as well as the renovation of the other two buildings and other required ancillary buildings. The facilities would be made fully functional to allow St. Jude Hospital to relocate from the stadium and operate until the new facility is built on the new site. In black and white, about my words, that's exactly what the intention was. The medium-term solution, construction of a new health care facility for St. Jude Hospital on a new site. This would entail the planning, design, and construction of a new 90-bed health care facility for St. Jude Hospital at a new site at Beau St. Jude, in the vicinity of George Odlum Stadium and future site of the National University. Upon relocation of the St. Jude Hospital to this new facility, 
The old site buildings would be utilized for one for other medical, medically related purposes, such as medical research. Ready for this one? Or medical school. The rationale for constructing the new facility is as follows. It would facilitate a synergy with the National Vision Plan and act as a catalyst for redevelopment of the South in general. Its functions would be expanded to use as a teaching facility. It would be used to facilitate healthcare tourism and serve St. Lucian's Caribbean nationals as well as other foreign nationals with specialized health care services. Mr. Speaker, that's going back to 2010. The intention was to operationalize the old building, move the patients as quickly as possible back into that building, and proceed to build a new building. And as I said, there were several sites Further, to the government of St. Lucia's commitment to the reconstruction of St. Jude Hospital, planning of this critical project commenced immediately after the fire. The associated construction works commenced on September 9th of 2010 with a groundbreaking ceremony. It was also the first anniversary of the fire. This provided an opportunity for the government of St. Lucia to communicate the broader vision of St. Jude Hospital, which was in keeping with the vision plan of, for the south of the island. Renovation works at the original site was expected to be complete um, for reopening of the facility and relocation for the George Allen Stadium by September 9th, 2011. It was supposed to be 100% complete. Due to the nature of the project, this is the great part, due to the nature of the project, it was initiated in phases to allow for simultaneous design and implementation. Although the main building damaged the fire was the surgical building, government took the decision to undertake a wide-scale renovation of the facility as other components were in a state of disrepair as the buildings were originally built in the 1940s and continue to pose a risk to the operations of this important healthcare facility at the lo that location. This included degraded electrical infrastructure, asbestos roofing material, and all buildings, asbestos, lag pipelines, inadequate water storage, and a, water, uh, a wastewater treatment, general dis uh, dilapidated building infrastructure. All the buildings of the facility were stripped completely, leaving in some cases only external concrete works. The renovation works also facilitated a reconfiguration of the hospital layout to improve the delivery of services, and some areas of extension of the buildings were facilitated. During the implementation of the works, additional requirements emerged and, and after thorough consideration, government approved and agreed to explore the options for financing and, and expansion of the scope of the works, which would include the additional components listed below. Several. Revised policy direction. So after the election, as a result of the change in scope and associated cost, it was determined that the approach to the renovation of the existing facility and construction of a Ms. new Speaker, facility at Bosinger. Mr. Speaker, on the point of clarification, um, I just would member like, of I would like the member for, for it's a point for, of just a, a clarification. Are you are you yielding, member? Very simple. Maybe that's not come back. Again. Yeah. No. 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 Go ahead. I'm um, just. He, the member was reading from a document, and he said, um, he, on page 7 of the document, that's where he's reading from, he said, revised policy decision. He omitted August 2011 p.m. Honorable Stevenson King. Yeah, my policy. That's what <laughs> let, me, let me repeat that again. Well, you know, I, I, thought, I, I, thought, I thought after I heard the presentations today that Stevenson King and yourselves were synonymous, so, I mean, my, my apology. <laughs> revised, policy, revised policy direction on August of 2011. So after the decision was made to fix up the old hospital, and it was gutted, and it was determined how much work would have to be done before the elections, because the elections took place in November of that year, Stevenson King, his, his administration, made a policy change. 
As a result of the change in scope and associated cost, it was determined that the approach to the renovation of the existing facility and construction of the new facility at Bosinjou be revisited. In this regard, a new strategic approach had been approved by the former Prime Minister King in August of 2011. This new approach allowed for the renovated facility to be retained and, and, and a smaller specialist hotel, uh, sorry, hospital, to be constructed on the new site. As a result, the approach was expected to guarantee the reinstatement of St. Jude Hospital completely at its original site with new and improved infrastructure. The preliminary design for the specialist facility was initiated with the commencement of needs assessment to inform the design, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. So Mr. Speaker, the decision was then made to abandon the idea of moving the people in, in a smaller facility and because of the extensiveness of the works. And you can imagine an 80-year-old building. An 80-year-old building. Even if it was gutted, it's an 80-year-old building, okay? with limited space. And so the decision was made to expand that facility and to broaden the scope of services that it originally was offering. So Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, this then continued. And if we go to, I won't get into all the administrative and cost problems that were associated with the building. We've already heard about that. If we go to page, if we go to page, if we go to, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to have enough time. Are you going to give me, going to give me more time? Are you going to give me more time? Are you going to give me more time? Anyway. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the Shanta King report, and I will get to it. The total project expenditure, when the new administration came in for the five years, and they continued the program of expanding the hospital and decided to expand it even further. So to take the special technical hospital and actually make it now the real hospital, a new modern hospital is what the intention was. And so in the five years, Mr. Speaker, including the two years with um, Minister King, the total project expenditure as of July 31st, 2016, was $98,451,000. But that did not include bills that were still outstanding and had not been processed. We now know in the report that that amount came to $130 million, was spent on the building, yes, $130 million is what had been spent on the building. Okay? The project costs consist of payment of invoices and certificates from the contractors. So, Speaker, if we now go to page 18, Mr. Speaker. Issues, challenges, and constraints. So again, I think that this summarizes many of the things that are detailed. Member of Castro Central. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I, I sit here and I'm trying desperately to contain myself and to listen to uh, do the the contribution for the member, from the member for Miku South. But Mr. Speaker, he continues to mislead the House. He indicated that the Shanta King's report said that the, the original St. Jude cost X amount. And he goes on to say, we now know that it cost 130 million. What is the source of his information? That is misleading the House, Mr. Speaker. How, how is that misleading the House? Because he referred to the Shanta King's report initially, indicated what the tabulated amount was, and then goes on to say, we... No, no, he also said that that figure did not include some outstanding bills. Yes, but Mr. Speaker, he must That is not misleading the House. Well, Mr. Speaker, he must give the source of the information at the very least. But I understand that, but the lack of the source of information cannot amount to misleading the House. Well, well, if you so rule, Mr. Speaker, I have to accede to your ruling, but can you ask the member to make the source of the, his information available to members of the House? Very well. 
Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. Ooh. Member for Castries North. The member for Miku South indicated that up to the time of my leadership as Prime Minister, the expenditure was 98 million. Four hundred and fifty-one thousand three forty-six. No, I think he said to the thirty-first of July, twenty sixteen. Okay. So again, just to help my colleague, Mr. Speaker, if I can, I didn't read it, but I'll go ahead and read it. It says, please note that all expenditure for the all financial years confirmed by the PMU and the Accounts Department. However, Accounts Department confirmation is pending for financial year 2016-2017 for a period ending in July 31st, 2016. And the report that speaks to the additional amount of monies was both in the uh, FDL report as well as in your own report um, that was written um, I think over a year ago, a year and a half ago. So Mr. Speaker, this part is very important. So we've heard today, financial resources, number one, this is on page 18, financial resources not available at the commencement of the project to facilitate the vision articulated in the policy direction. And, and everybody's admitted to that. And we get that. And so, having this loan now is a welcome opportunity to start afresh. You know that you're going to have the resources to complete the project. But that was not the case in 2011. And was not the case all the way through until 2016. Project was initiated as a result of an emergency and did not go through the normal project development cycle of similar projects which which is historically five to ten year period to physical implementation and i think that we all understand that there was a fire there was need for a hospital nobody expected nobody went into the stadium thinking that we were going to be in the stadium for 13 years no one so all the the political rhetoric that goes along with that Nobody intended that to be the case. And the PMU admitted that they were working in what we call parallel. Trying to find money, trying to work on a design, and trying to expedite the project as fast as possible. That's what the PMU unit was trying to do. Mr. We, 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 we can agree to disagree. This resulted in initial policy direction of basic renovation on old site and new development of a new site through a, you know, it's just amazing to go back and to read these documents, Mr. Speaker. Because we've allowed the politics of the situation to cloud everybody's minds and to, and to, and to, and to suggest, to suggest, Mr. Speaker, that there was some devious movement afoot. This is 2016 written by Shanta King. This resulted in the initial policy direction of basic renovation of an old site and new development on new site through a public-private partnership. The International Finance Corporation of the World Bank was engaged to work with the government to facilitate the financing and implementation of a new facility. IFC counterpart Ms. Michelle Otti, initially, initially both short and medium term solutions were being implemented simultaneously. So when they understood the deficiencies of moving into the old building and what it would actually be able to serve, the decision, Mr. Speaker, was made now to look at building a new hospital under a PPP. Project implementation commenced on the original site in September of 2010 with minimal funding to facilitate only the short-term solution. Planning design and construction had to be undertaken simultaneously by breaking up into sub-components, which is not normally the preferred mode of implementation but was necessary in an effort to progress quickly. 
So even though they knew they didn't have a plan, Mr. Speaker, even though they didn't have a final budget, Mr. Speaker, understanding the urgency of the matter, they proceeded to do things as they could. Project uh, change in policy direction, August of 2011, resulted in replanning exercise to facilitate permanent reoccupation of St. Jude Hospital. However, so that's different. Remember the initial plan, Mr. Speaker, was to fix up the old burnt building and move into it temporarily. And when they moved into it temporarily, then the decision was made to build a new facility and to have a permanent occupation of that. In 2011, that plan was changed and the decision was made to expand the old facility and to make it so that it could become a permanent solution to the hospital in the South. Not my words, Mr. Speaker. 2016. However, financing was not available to meet the requirements of this new direction. As such, the PMU developed a strategy to disaggregate the outstanding works into smaller components and into thematic areas to qualify for target sources of funding such as water, wastewater components, renewable energy components, medical equipment components. This resulted in the project management union preparing various proposals for funding. Mexican government, German government, World Bank, United States government, and Taiwanese government. So what does that mean? They could not get the financing for the whole project. So what they went and did is look for specialty areas. So the Germans came in with the renewable energy. The Mexicans came in with the morgue and the ambulance center. Everybody was coming in with specifics. And guess what? Part of that specifics is that they provided equipment. So from a very early stage, Mr. Speaker, equipment was being provided to a hospital that there was no date anybody knew as to when it was going to be completed. And that equipment was put into containers to hold when the hospital was ready. Some of the hospital, some of the equipment, some of the equipment, Mr. Speaker, was actually put into operation at the stadium. Mr. Speaker, construction of the site from 2010 to 2014 was directly related to the limited funds available through the government of St. Lucia, Republic of China, Taiwan, German government, Australian government. With the change in the implementation strategy, there was a greater demand on the government of St. Lucia to mobilize financial resources to facilitate the implementation of works. During the period 2012 and 2015, the availability of funding, funding that dictated the pace of works on the ground. So when we used to go and see that the minister was going there and saying, work's coming on, great. We're going to be opening up the hospital very soon. Mati. Mati. Okay. Lie. 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 And that's why every single time up until the elections in 2016, okay, all we kept on seeing was a rollover date as to when the hospital was going to be ready. So, Mr. Speaker. But you were in the government. You were in the government. Mr. Speaker, it seems that members from the, on the opposite side, one in particular, Mr. Speaker, seems to be suffering from jet lag. Mr. Speaker, not, not a, <laughs> in November, in November of 2013, a request was made to the Taiwanese government for a loan to facilitate the completion of the hospital. This loan was processed and approved with the signing. Member, of the member for Microsoft, just hold on. Members, whilst I tolerate interactions which are clearly designed to deal with the bill. I will not tolerate interactions that are meant simply to disturb the member on his feet. This procedure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Phase one included all areas which could have been completed with the Taiwanese loan funds, which would permit St. Jude Hospital to relocate from the stadium. This included all buildings in the entryway, as well as the critical structures, as well as other structures that would, could be constructed based on available funds. 
Also in phase one was the German funded component for water and wastewater components, which was implemented. In keeping with the strategy of submitting multiple funding proposals, the PMU submitted a request for funding for the implementation of renewable energy solutions for the hospital. Sorry. This was approved for submission in January of 2014 and was submitted to the focal point for the relevant project of the Ministry of Sustainable Development. Phase two included the Mexican funded component. Phase three included components that would have been delayed if the requisite funds were not available for implementation with phase one, isolation building, decontamination building, accommodation building, training equipment, other equipment, maintenance contracts, general and medical training. And I think for the layman, Mr. Speaker, even though there were three components, three phases here, clearly the hospital would not have been able to be functional if in fact all three phases were not completed. It's impossible. How would you operate a hospital without those basic services and basic uh, supplies? Challenges with the original main contractor, Cyril Donnelly. That's been very well documented. I'm not going to go into that. It speaks about the um, change over to SADU. It speaks about um, the contractor that they had providing consultancy. Equipment and materials and storage. This is 2016. 2016, Mr. Speaker. During the implementation of the project, it became necessary to store construction materials and associated equipment. All materials and equipment stored are the responsibility of the relevant contractors until incorporated into the works or installed. Halcro Group li Limited to provide the details on equipment and materials in storage, on site and off site. So materials were not only being stored on site, but they were being stored off site. Medical equipment procured, uh, procured through the project currently in storage include equipment supplied by Holier Construction. The storage of the equipment and the furniture from its company was communicated to the project steering committee. The, the equipment and storage has been reviewed periodically by the consultant, referred to the recommendations by Halcro. Over the last two and a half years, there have been a number of requests from St. Jude Hospital being aware of the equipment storage. Based on the request from the St. Jude Hospital, a number of pieces of equipment have been transferred. So again, that's just to reinforce and to provide the evidence, Mr. Speaker, of what I was saying was correct. Equipment had arrived. Equipment was in storage. The problem was the hospital was not ready. And that equipment was being stored, Mr. Speaker, not only on the site, it was being stored in containers in Canada, containers in New York, stored in containers here in St. Lucia, was, being con was in containers and in warehouses of the suppliers. So Mr. Speaker, to come now and want to make this suggestion that in the last five years that uh, there was new equipment, there's no new equipment. That's all the equipment that we've been talking about all the way going back from 2012 to 2016. Supply and installation of medical equipment. Initially, the project scope did not include the supply and installation of medical and specialized equipment. Over time, as the scope changed and there was a need to include key pieces of equipment, over the years, various pieces of equipment have been catered for with respect to replacement upon transfer of the new purchase. However, due to the delay in completion of the works, the equipment needs to have increased due to equipment in use at the stadium. So after purchasing equipment and sending it to the stadium, now there was a realization that we'd have to go and repurchase new equipment by the time you moved into the stadium. Proposals were received from Accreditation Canada, which never happened. Development Control Authority planning, as of July of 2016, no planning approval. Since the establishment, but this says it right here. I'm gonna say on page 24, remember from Cass Street, from, uh, from Viewfort South, it says the application was recommended for approval. However, the Ministry of Physical Development informed that the board has requested a, per a presentation of the project prior to approval. The PMU has agreed to the presentation and was awaiting information on the schedule. Subsequently, the Development Control Authority was was no. I'm saying uh, I'm saying was misleading. It wasn't correct. What 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 did I say? It was misleading. 
if I threw you, Mr. Speaker. That it wasn't approved, but that's not what this is saying. It is. It's saying up until July of 2016, no DC approval was given. No, no, no approval had been given. You all hit the fans. Why? You told them to hide it. No, Mr. Speaker. I'm, this is, this is, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Remember, Mr. Speaker. You all told the people that you see it. Hide the plans when you got into office. Mr. Speaker. Never allow it to see the light of day. Mr. Speaker, this is, Mr. Speaker, this is a report that was written in August of 2016. Okay, so this is after his administration and before we took over the project. And the fact is, is that up until that point, the PMU, I want to make it very clear, the PMU department that was operating in the Prime Minister's office, in the Prime Minister's office, admitted that they had no planning approval before July 16th, 2016. None. And it, it highlights several attempts to make it happen, but because of the inadequacy of the information that was being provided, planning approval was not so given. Who says that? You say that. 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 Mr. Speaker, the establishment of the St. Jude Hospital. Order, order. Mr. Speaker, we then have, again, further evidence of how much the project had cost and the significant delays that were made. Mr. Speaker, this is all very, very relevant to the loans, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a, a letter on March 30th, 2016, Mr. Speaker. It was a letter from the Permanent Secretary to the then the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. References made to the current contract between the government of St. Lucia. References made to the current contract between the government of St. Lucia and Halco Group Limited to facilitate the design, procurement, and supervision services associated with the St. Jude Hospital reconstruction project. This contract expires on March 31st of 2016. There were various delays with respect to the implementation of the works, ranging from the availability of funding to the remobilization of contractors. Also delayed was the approval of the Mexican grant to facilitate the completion of phase two of the building, which includes the construction of the morgue building. As such, there's been delays in the completion of phase one and two of the project, which is expected to result in the return of St. Jude Hospital to its original location. Consequently, 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 the revised completion date is estimated at September 2016, which would allow for transition to the new facility to commence by December 2016. It is expected that the defects liability period would, consequent upon the continuation of the works, there is need for continued supervision of its various works and supplies contract. Given the ex the circumstances related to the need for completion and transition into the new facility, it would be practical to continue with the services of the existing firm with supervision. Additionally, a change in a supervision consulting firm may result in addition delay. The new award would result in a revised estimate design supervision of $15 million. Total project cost is estimated, Mr. Speaker, this is a document from the Permanent Secretary in the Prime Minister's office on March 30th. It says the total project cost is estimated at 100... What year? 2016. Well, so say the year. I said the year. You never said the year. I did. This is because my, my member, the member is definitely suffering from jet lag. The total, the total project, the total project cost is estimated. I don't know. I don't know. Is estimated at EC dollars, 178 million. 
So in March 30th, 2016, the then Prime Minister Kenny Anthony was advised by his permanent secretary that because of the delays and changes in the design, that the cost of the project now was going to be $178 million. With a supervision to cost ratio of 87%. Therefore, in accordance with the powers... Member for Castry Central. Mr. Speaker, I, I think I've been in this house. I'm rising, Mr. Speaker, basically on a point of order. I mean, I've been in this chamber for the last 17 years or thereabout, and I believe even if the member for Miku South is a relatively newcomer, he had occupied the prime ministerial chair for over five years. And to come in this house, Mr. Speaker, and to be basically reading to parliament, that goes against the general rubric of debate and it goes against the, 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 the standing orders. So as a member to at least make his contribution, he can refer to the text, but for the last half hour or so, Mr. Speaker, we has been reading from a report that he never wanted to see, that he literally hid when he became Prime Minister. Remember, if he wishes to take his hour to read the report, that's his business. If your point of order is that what he is reading is not germane to the bill, it is that, not, to the it, motion, well, then you need to say so. But well, it is to, not say that, yes. to say that he's been reading, Mr. Um, Speaker, it's, not, it's not a breach of the rules. I, I stand corrected, Mr. Speaker, and that is why I always defer to your wisdom insofar as parliamentary procedure is concerned. Mr. Speaker, we are debating the borrowing of some money to continue the construction of St. Jude. We are here to debate the terms, the conditions, and everything else in relation to that loan. And here we are, having a member of, of parliament referring to a report of 2016 and just reading it in its entirety, carrying absolutely no relevance to the motion before us today, Mr. Speaker. Ah, fair enough. Uh, member for Miku South, you have been given great latitude in making your presentation, but you would have to tie it to the motion before the House, which I must confess you have not yet done. So please tie it to the motion. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thought that, you know, after listening to the presentations of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health, that the debate had been broadened. But I'd be very happy to comply, Mr. Speaker, and I will soon get there. And just to say to the member that we've actually moved on from the report, and we're speaking, we're speaking about a letter that was written to the Prime Minister in March of 2016, where now it is being estimated that the cost of the project, and that's how we're going to get, we're going to tie everything, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about how much money we're borrowing today and what we intend to use that money for. And that's the purpose of, of Parliament. And that's certainly what the purpose of, of the opposition is, is to question not only the terms of the loan, but the use of the loan. And, and the members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, have gone to some extent to explain what the balloon is going to be used for and their, and their justification. And by reading the report, I wanted to certainly emphasize, Mr. Speaker, that the words that I'm uttering are not my words. These words are words that were written all the way back in 2011 and in 2016. So in 2016, Mr. Speaker, very importantly, that we now have a document that says at that point, that it wasn't going to cost $98 million, it was going to cost $178 million, and that the project would only be hopefully operational, meaning moved, ready to be moved in to then operationalize in December. And my point of all of this information will be made very clear. So, Mr. Speaker, when we got into office... Member of Castries Office. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm standing on the point of order. Since the member is providing such information from these documents, I do not have a copy of it. Can he make it a document of the House so I could follow in entirety? Because I think he's, re he's representing snippets of the documents and not the documents in entirety. I again want to remind members of the rules of making documents documents of the House. The opposition is not so obliged. I would be happy if he would make it, but I cannot direct him to make it. 
So, Mr. Speaker, I, I do know for a fact that all of these documents that I've been making reference to are documents of the House. And I'm sure the Parliament Office will be very happy to get you a, a copy. Um, at the end of my, uh, my presentation, I'll be happy to make my copy available to you, if you so wish. So, Mr. Speaker? When you say a documented house, is it this current house? Yes, sir. We had a debate, we had a, a long debate when they presented... Well, I have, to the best of my knowledge, I have presided since August 2021, and I have not seen that document, so... Mr. If it's a document of the house, it would be a house prior to this one. No. When we had, when, Mr. Speaker, when we had a debate on the um, interim report by the, by the government, all of these documents were made documents of the house. But I'm happy to make them available to the House once again, Mr. Speaker. Fair. Mr. Speaker, upon getting into office, and this is where really we, we start now. Remember, you have 15 minutes left. Just one minute. Mr. Speaker, of all the interruptions, and I started at half past. I, I, half I wish past. to remind you of the standing orders, which are clear, pellucid, and unambiguous. And so far as time is concerned, the ruling of the presiding officer shall stand. My records will show you started at exactly 12.20, and the hand side can provide that. I would like one to sure. Half an hour. Mr. Speaker, I move that <coughs> sign order number 3210, evoke to, <coughs> to invoke to give the member for Microsoft. 40 more minutes. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the member from Miku South an additional 40 minutes in which to complete his presentation. I now put the, I now put the question as many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues for the opportunity. We did an hour. <laughs> we, we always did it for you. We always did, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, despite despite the politics, Mr. Speaker, the member from from Zufort South has a very special place in the politics of St. Lucia. And I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm very, very, and I'm very happy that we show him the respect of his maturity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, here, here's where the real issue starts coming in, Mr. Speaker, and really now relates to where we are today and the discussion and the motion that's been put forward in front of the House. So we know that when we came into office in 2016, we had a, a building, a development that with the best intentions, I'm not going to sit here, Mr. Speaker, and cast any aspersions that anybody had any other, any other goal other than doing what they thought was the best for the South. And, th and that's fine. So we had the benefit in 2016, as you have the benefit in 2022, to have history, to, where you don't have to guess anymore. There's clear evidence of more detail and factual information as to where we are. And that's important. It's important to know that, what do they say, that the uh, Repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. So we saw that in this report, attempts to refurbish, rebuild an 80-year-old building and at the same time marry the needs of the South and also the role that this facility was going to play caused the development to continuously to grow in size. So not only we were dealing with the changes of standards, but we were dealing with the change in needs. And as a result of it, 
we had already spent $130 million. And the expectation, according to the Ministry of Finance, in March of, of, of 2016, of then the then uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, was that it's going to take another $50 million on top of that to complete the building. $180 million. So when we came in, Mr. Speaker, work continued. But work continued at a very slow pace because there was no financing in place to allow the work to take place on a, in a steadfast way. And my government at the time, after a lot of heartache trying to figure out what to do, which included, do we just downsize the ambition of that old building and try to go back to the original concept of just operationalizing it as fast as possible? Because very mindful of, I think, that the member from Labry used to refer to the stadium as the hellhole. Mindful of the suffering that people were going through in the hellhole, which is only a tribute to the workers. Because the hellhole is the building itself. It's not the workers. It's not the doctors. It's not the nurses. They're doing an incredible job in that hellhole. But it's also gotten to a point where we call it stadium fatigue. Psychologically, that's where we are, stadium fatigue. We, we were at stadium fatigue in 2016. We're just at a depressed state of fatigue at this point. So we commissioned a study, Mr. Speaker. Yes, the commission, the study cost a million dollars. And when you put a million dollars in context of $180 million, Mr. Speaker, um, I think it's money that's well spent. What? And I, w I also appreciate the comments of Dr. King. Member for Miku South, I appreciate the lessons of history. What we are faced with today, though, is the fact that the current administration has made a decision. And that decision has resulted in a motion being brought today for borrowing. You must bring your statements to that motion, and you're not doing that. What you're doing is giving us a history of the thoughts of your government. There is a time and place for that debate, I think, but I don't think a motion to borrow 208 million uh, Saudi Arabian reals is the place for it. Please bring your comments to the motion before the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be so guided. Um, the point of the history, Mr. Speaker, was to bring and put in context, and I'm making the comparison as to where we were in 2016, which in my mind is exactly where the government is today, in making the decision to borrow the $200 million, 75 million US dollars, to complete St. Jude's. And the point here, Mr. Speaker, is, is that the, the government today, while in opposition, and I have the numerous articles, Mr. Speaker, um, which I'll be happy to make um, in the House. Um, John Peters, in 2017, what has happened at St. Jude's is a disgrace. It's the worst I've ever seen it in my 34 years of engineering in terms of contract administration. It is a mess of Herculean, as it says, proportions. It was sad as a professional engineer reading such a document and to see how state funds have been so wasted. Mr. Speaker, we have an article in the uh, 2000, sorry, in 2018, Mr. Speaker. This was 2017. Yeah, 2018, Mr. Speaker, from The Voice. Complete St. Jude was the cries of the, uh, of the then opposition. Architect Mark Hennicott also present at the SLMDA's press conference provided figures supporting the argument that the St. Jude Hospital, if worked on immediately, could have its most critical wings completed and moved into by August. This is an article that came out in April. And that the entire hospital could be completed by February of the next year. You have an article which says from the, Prime Minister, the now Prime Minister and the then leader of the opposition, which is an article um, on St. Jude's. 
He says, further, the hospital, which was six months away from completion, which could have been finished with the loan funds of $20 million that were made available by the RSC in Taiwan, particularly drawn down. So he's saying that when we came into office, the $20 million loan, of which $10 million had already been drawn down, 10 million US dollars, could have completed Sinju's. Mr. Speaker, that's that's the uh, that's the that's what that is what you all keep saying. Member that is what the member South, I, uh, you are hearing me, but you are not listening to me. There is a history to send you, but a decision has been made. We can debate wrongly or rightly to complete a structure. What we have before us is a motion to borrow money to complete that structure, and you need to confine your comments to that, that motion. You're not doing that. Saying what the then leader of the opposition said in 2018, and what the former prime minister said, does not lend to the motion before us. Please get to the motion so that you can continue your, your, your contribution. Mr. Speaker, um, for your benefit, sir. The issue at hand here is, is that, as the opposition, we're coming here to debate two things of the bill. The terms of the bill. We find the terms of the bill extremely accessible. The source of the monies, the Saudi Foundation, have no difficulties with the Saudi Foundation, as I said from the beginning. Very happy to see that Saudi Arabia is paying an interest in CARICOM and is now investing these kinds of funds into our region. Because it's not just St. Lucia. All the CARICOM islands have received the same $75 million loan um, opportunity. All of them. So this idea that, that, that you all cared so much you went out and found the money. Mr. You didn't go out and find the money. Mr. The, Mr. the Mr. money Mr. was presented and you've chosen to Remember use for the money. Cast Mr. Speaker, on, a point of, on a point of order, Mr. Speaker. I, Remember Mr. for Castry Central, there is a member on his feet. I can, I can tell you in non certain terms that all the islands of CARICOM have not received $75 million. I can tell you from nonsense terms because I happen to have the information. This is not, this is not, the members of all the members have not received $75 million. What? Only Grenada? Not even St. Vincent, Jamaica. Uh, Member for Miku South, your statement was that all other CARICOM countries have received $75 million. The Minister for Finance has rebutted that. What is your response to that? Ms. My, my, my response... Members, member, members... If, 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 in fact, the interpretation was that I meant all, I said that some of the CARICOM countries, if not all, and the Prime Minister is a current sitting Prime Minister, he would know better, but I know that there are other CARICOM states that have received um, the same funds and the same amount. So, Mr. Speaker, this wasn't a special thing for St. Lucia. This was something that was done. That when the member was here, did he not fly to St. Vincent? Okay. So, I said, said to you, I'm very happy. The opposition is very happy for the Saudi loan. Um, we're very happy for the terms of the Saudi loan. We're also very happy that the Saudis have chosen not to put the money through CDB and to facilitate a quicker ex expenditure uh, uh, implementation. We've said all those things, Mr. Speaker. The question that we have is what the government is intending to use the money for. And the purpose of going back in history is to say that the government has a choice. You're 100% right, Mr. Speaker. This is the government. It is their discretionary decision. But as the opposition, we have every right to challenge what that discretionary decision is and the evidence behind that discretionary decision. You certainly do, but not on a debate on the borrowing of the 280 million. So. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker I, 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 I sat and listened to the Prime Minister and to the Minister of Health, the, Minister, the member from Castries East and also the member from Viewfort North, who spoke about what the monies were going to be used for. They've opened it up in the debate. And so I would like the opportunity to express that the United Workers' Party, the opposition, sorry, okay, is not in support with how the money is going to be used. Fair enough, member. It's just how you phrase it that's going to be the issue. No problem, Mr. Speaker. Okay? So the, 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 the point of all of this is to show that when we came into office in 2016, we were faced with the dilemma of a building that it was estimated that was going to take $180 million. 
another $50 million to complete. And that was when they thought the expenditure was 98, but the expenditure was 130. So it may be even be more than the, than the, one, the $180 million. Okay, Mr. Speaker. So we also understood, and once we completed the report, and I have the report here, Mr. Speaker, which is the FDL report. The report speaks to all of the deficiencies of the building. Zoning issues, several buildings located in areas on site where their functionality appears not to have been considered. Cases in the west wing where the sizing of corridors is significantly below the recommendation minimum size. The effects aggress, the ability of, you know, Mr. Speaker, you know, the, the members, the members um, have a 212 page report and want to go to one line, and I'll repeat the reading line, right? Where it says is that despite all of these deficiencies, that the building is salvageable. And, it's salv and the building is salvageable at what standard? And then the question becomes, at what cost, Mr. Speaker? At what cost? Remember, Mr. Speaker, the members on the opposite side said in opposition that this would take Clorox and 30 million EC dollars. Why are we waiting? Why don't we open the hospital? That's all it would take. It's 90% completed. Move into the hospital. And yet when we did the study, the study showed exactly what your own study showed. Want me to read it for you? When you go to your own study, when you go to page, Page 18, sorry, not page 18. hiding on me. If you go to page 28, Mr. Speaker, of the, the report that was submitted to the Prime Minister um, by the SJHRP Review Committee, 28th of October, 2021, it says assumptions. The state of completion of the works associated with the hospital phase one which the review committee has observed at the time of the visit of the 21st of September, suggests that many of the buildings and functional spaces are more than 75% completed. So we've gone from 90% now to 75%. And that only more two time. areas which Mr. still Speaker. require major Mr. work. Speaker, I said Mr. that. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition must stop misleading the House and the general public. Because it was in the intimated earlier that the former St. Jude was about 90%. The report says more than 75. More than 75. 90 is certainly more than 75. But he's saying it has gone down from 90 to 75. Ask him to stop misleading the public. More than 75, read it, read it. Mr. Speaker, regardless of the approach adopted, a transition plan must therefore be based on, but not limited to any or all of the following assumptions. The government of Sinusia shall be privy to and can terminate or vary all current ongoing contracts. B, all construction documentation including project drawings are ready available for review and for reference by others. Phase one can attain full approval from the Development Control Authority. The transfer of the entire operations um, of the St. Jude's at the, to, from, can commence within 18 months from the uh, stadium, George, George, uh, George Odlum Stadium. Finance for undertaking and completing all its down and being works is available. 
Installation of internal building services, including power, lighting, air conditioning, CCTV surveillance, fire safety, and approximately, are, are approximately 50% completed. In general, partitions within key buildings are in lightweight and freestanding. All outstanding doors and windows for the projects are deemed to be materials on site. Allow all outstanding floor and wall ceiling finishes are deemed to be materials on site. It goes through a whole list of assumptions, and the question is, Mr. Speaker, how much is the, the completion of the new hospital, of the old hospital, the 80-year-old building, going to cost? So if you're drawing down $200 million, and it begs the question, all the reports say that going into the old building, you're not going to have an efficient hospital. You're not. All the reports say the same thing, Mr. Speaker. And so you're faced with the same dilemma that we were faced with in 2016. Do you proceed to continue to build in an old building, Mr. Speaker, in which every time we proceed, we find more problems? Every time that we now see expansion in St. Lucia, we change the terms of what we want the hospital to be able to achieve. Or do like us and go and build a new hospital which was the plan before. So if you have $200 million, go and build the people in the South a proper hospital and revert back to the plans that we had all those years ago and use the old building as a training center, as a university, exactly what we said. Why? Why would you want to go into this old building? Are you so, what's, what's the obsession? All the evidence, Mr. Speaker, speaks contrary to go in there. So, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the new building, let's talk about the new building. First of all, they came out and said, oh, the cladding is not fireproof. And there's no roof. Okay, there's but the roof. roof is easy. It's easy. It's easy, a membrane. What, what are we talking about, Mr. Speaker? It's a modern facility that just requires a membrane to seal the top of the roof. Without the roof. Okay, without a roof. Okay, how many how many concrete roofs do we see in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker? Okay, and you put the material on the membrane on in order to seal it. Nonsense, you want to make it out uh, make it out to believe that this is an impossibility? This is easy. So first of all, that's how you do it. You have to clad it first before you put the roof on. You don't put the roof on and then clad it. Mr. Speaker, so let us let us let us let us speak, let us speak to the technology that was being used. So first of all, just so that we can get on the same page, Mr. Speaker. Members on the opposite side, and I'm glad that they're laughing, because it's not a laughing matter. Okay? Here it is that in your own present in your own in your own presentation you said that you're going to use the dialysis building and the rehab building. What materials were used for the rehab building and the dialysis building? The same cladding. The same cladding that's on the main structure is the same one that y'all are going to use in the expansion of your own project. So go come and tell me that you all of a sudden don't believe in the technology. We talked about climate change. That's how the Prime Minister started off. That's why I had to giggle. The box meeting, like right? the, fire the climate change. The box so the modern building has a technology to reduce the heat on the outside, to absorb the cold on the inside, so the condensation takes place in a cavity. It also, by making sure that the heat on the outside is reduced before it hits the wall, the cold wall on the inside, it increases the efficiency of cooling the building. We also have another problem, Mr. Speaker. The technology, the technology in healthcare is changing so rapidly that buildings that you build today within a very short pace of time become obsolete. So the new development that they have is to put all of the utilities in the ceiling and all of the utility wires in terms of electrical and plumbing are in the drywall. So anytime that you want to change the configuration of the floor, it's an easy thing. Instead of going around St. Lucia and you see trunking everywhere you go. Why? Because it's all in the concrete buildings. That technology has changed. You have it earthquake proof, you have it hurricane proof. All of those things are in a modern, purposefully built design hospital. And if you want to see what the, com and if you want to see what the completion looks like, I will pay your airfare 
to go to Cayman and you can go and see what the hospital looks like. Okay? World class. World class. Okay, that is making a significant contribution to the development of the economy in Cayman. Because in addition to providing the local services, the intention was exactly what the plan was in 2006. Sorry, in 2010. Was to use the old building as a school and to make sure that the new hospital that we had provided services not only for locals, but also became a regional source of... of Why were you sharing it down? Mr. Speaker, I've heard, mem I've heard members speak about um, breaking down of buildings. And let's remember, Mr. Speaker, that during the period of 2011 and 2016, several buildings were demolished. In fact, if you want to go and see the graveyard of concrete, just go by the Heineken factory by the gas station, and there's a burial ground of all of it there. The two buildings that were demolished, Mr. Speaker, one was the old dialysis and the other one was the old morgue building. And the, and the reality was is that the, the dialysis center was built over a tree trunk. And it was impossible to stop the leaking of that building. Every time it rained, all that building would go. And the other building, Mr. Speaker, the ceiling and the walls were defective. Small buildings. And we rebuild them with proper buildings. In fact, those are the same buildings today, Mr. Speaker that this government now is going to go and use, using the same cladding. The same cladding. Yes, but you must, they must be have a roof because you're, moving, you're, you're using them. You, 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 you put it in, Mr. Speaker. So the, the issue here, Mr. Speaker, is if you're confronted with history, and history has shown that the old site is difficult, and has been difficult. And despite the allegations of 90% complete, or if you just want to go and put some Clorox and, and, and move in, all that is through the window. Because I have to imagine, Mr. Speaker, if in fact that this government could have done that in the first two years, they would have. You've not done it. And to make matters worse, you said that when we said it was going to cost $100 million to complete the building, and we said that. And we said we don't even know if it's $100 million because of the deficiencies. You are now coming to the house to borrow $200 million. What does that say? That we were right all along. Now you're 100% right, Mr. Speaker. At this juncture, it is for the government to make the discretionary decision what is in the best interest of the people of this country. And right now I know that if you wanted to move into the new modern building, you can move into the ground floor, 110,000 square feet, Mr. Speaker. The design was done for 90 beds. I don't even know how many beds you're going to get into the, into, into the old building. 28 buildings. Are you going to consolidate the buildings? So is it that everybody has to leave the buildings to go all around the place? That's what St. Lucia is worth? How does it keep with your expansion of, of the view fort? Or maybe you don't intend to expand the view fort. I heard the member from, Cass, from, from View Fort South last time say, um, I should apologize because uh, there's no agreement that they're not going to put a, a pier in, uh, in View Fort. Where's the pier? You all had a big, a big announcement. I saw nobody from View Fort there. I saw Miss Secrets, sorry, the member from uh, South Souffler was there. Absolutely. And all the plans were there and ready to go. And if we get, and when we get back into government, we'll make sure that the pier goes in there. I can assure you that. I'll make sure the pier is going to be there. You should have put the pier in since 1997. Member for Mikusa, what does a pier in Viewfort have to do with the motion before us? I mean, you are, you are right that technology changes. What does not change is what is in the standing orders. You must stick to the motion. And if you're not going to stick to the motion, I've been very liberal, but if you're not going to stick to the motion, then. Mr. Speaker, I'm just saying that maybe, maybe the design, maybe the design of the hospital has been reduced because the ambition for the view fort has been reduced. That's all I'm asking. If in fact you're going to put a home port in view fort, 
if you're going to put a home port in Viewfort and have over 100,000 passengers going through the home port in Viewfort and given the opportunities with the crew that maybe you would have expected a growth and an upsizing of the hospital. That's all. So, but maybe, maybe there's, maybe, and maybe that when we come to debate it, the government will articulate what its, what its assumptions are. Well, Has the plan the, changed? What was the final cost of the box? I want to find out. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what the box is, but I can say that in a modern building, we spent $130 million, of which we still owed Fresh Start $25 million. And that we had to, a $50 million to complete the ground floor. So hence, the, the loan that was being put to the house, the $75 million oh, that the Prime Minister... Really, it would have been about $300 million ec dollars not at all. No. Yes. No, but if, if you have to spend on the ground... Sorry. That's okay. Speaker. No, no, no. I'm I was just going to say to the member... I was just going to say to the member from Miku South that he wishes to entertain every aside and then he'll complain about time. I stop it, Mr. Speaker. You're free to make this size, but the member from Miku South should stay focused on the motion. So, Mr. Speaker, what we're now, what we're now seeing unraveling here is the big lie. Okay? The big lie is, is that it would have taken, and it's going to take, in excess of $100 million to finish the old building. I don't know what that final number is going to be, but in excess of 100 million. And the question is we have to ask ourselves, can we fix the problems sufficiently in the old building? Can the electricals be redone? Can the plumbing be redone? Can the hallways be redone? Can the building materials change? Can those be done sufficiently to, to guarantee and assure the safety of the public? Do we know how much it's going to cost to fix those problems? Do we even know if we're going to get planning approval? Because up to now, there's no planning approval. Because my understanding is, y'all don't even have a plan. There is no plan right now for St. Jude's. Two years in office. Two years in office. There's no plan. We don't even know how long it's going to take. And I would say to you, Mr. Speaker, certainly from a United Workers' Party or from an opposition perspective, Mr. Speaker, our ambition for View Fort is very high. We want to see the expansion of View Fort. We genuinely do believe that in order for St. Lucia to get to the, make a quantum leap in economic in economic growth, that we have to be able to develop the South. Okay, Mr. Speaker. So the hotel developments, sandy beach development into a village tourism complex, horse racing. All of these things were tying into the airport expansion, to the um, hospital expansion, the call centers, and with the idea, Mr. Speaker, that persons who have been migrating from the south to the north, leaving their families, that we were going to create an opportunity for Mr. Speaker for them to come down. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, because we've not even discussed a major issue, which I know it's not the subject of this debate, but will be the subject of the debate. When this government was in office in 2011 to 2016 and could not operationalize OKE. What did they have? They had a, a naming ceremony. And after the naming ceremony, the hospital remained closed, Mr. Speaker, for four years. You know why? Because they could not operationalize it, had never put a financial budget in place to operationalize it, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I believe the same thing now is going to happen. They're going to build a monstrosity that is going to be an operational nightmare and is going to, ex going to extremely increase the cost of operations for healthcare. And they can't even run healthcare today. They can't run it today. The hospital is a disaster. The healthcare center is a disaster. Wow. This idea that you're talking about universal healthcare and what you want to come now and, and, and roll out some things, okay? 
So all I'm saying to Mr. B, you know, with, with the horses, at least we had a private sector person paying for the horses. Okay? You, you on the other hand, are taking taxpayers' money to fool the people and provide them with substandards in, in, in healthcare, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to that debate when we can discuss how much it's going to cost to operationalize once you have the plans. You all don't even have the plans. So, Mr. Speaker, in closing, I want to be very clear. We support the loan. We're again are very appreciative to the Saudi Arabians for what they've done and for their entry into the CARICOM market. We applaud and we're hoping that more countries will develop bilateral relationships with our islands and go past CDB because all of us have had our issues with the processes that CDB has and how long it takes to implement projects. And I want to say this, Mr. Speaker. We decided to build a new hospital because we realized the amount of money and the amount of time it was going to take and the uncertainty to rescue the old one would be inefficient. But you know what the difference is, Mr. Speaker? We will continuously fight to save lives and livelihoods, but we will never, ever fight to protect the victory. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.